Hello, everyone. Today I'm with Dr. Eric Kaufman. Eric is a Canadian professor of politics at the University of Buckingham, where he's also the director at the Centre for Hector Ops Social Science. Eric is the author of a number of books, including Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth, The Orange Order, The Rise and Fall of Anglo American. Eric has a new book, uh, which is called Taboo, How Making Race Sacred Produced a Cultural Revolution. And in the US, that book is called The Third Awakening, and they've just been released. So welcome, Eric. Thanks. It's great to be here, John. Um, Eric, I, there's one thing you've said, which I like very much. I'm just going to read from the start. In a post-woke vision, uh, sorry, a post-woke vision foregrounds resilience over victimhood focusing on all aspects of human flourishing. It seeks to optimize, not maximize diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today's woke cultural socialism leads only to division and stagnation. So I was hoping as we went on, somewhere down the track a little in this podcast, that we could maybe have a look at some of that, like uh, resilience, human flourishing, what you found, what you think about those things, and also to explain the difference between optimizing and maximizing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So hopefully we can get onto that. But Eric, I wonder whether, if it's okay by you, can we start with just a little bit of your story? I think when you started the book, you speak about a little bit of your experience and how you got onto this topic. Yeah, it's a really interesting, I mean, I'd say intellectually, you know, I really since my first book, The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America, um, I've been studying the cultural left. That's not the only thing. I mean, there are a number of themes in my work. One is the question of nationalism and population shifts. Um, but the other is this focus on the cultural left in not all, but in a number of my books, including the first one. So I have that longer history and studying it really from the 19th century right through to the present. Um, and so this book in a way is focusing, majoring on that strand. Mm. Um, the second thing of course is my own personal perhaps experience with this, you know, I've always kind of been outside the progressive majority in academia, um, quietly perhaps for most of my career, but, um, you, you, you snuck know, just, under the radar for quite some time there, Eric. Yeah, yeah, and then I sort of almost kind of happened into academia a bit by accident, and then, um, yeah, I guess starting around 2017, 18, I sort of was starting to be a bit more open about my criticisms of some of these things in the press, um, and that sort of began the the targeting. Now, I went, when I say targeting, I mean... What this what this is really about is a small number of radicals who don't brook any compromise and think that that they are you know they have the self righteousness that they their their way is the right way and anyone who disagrees with it is is an enemy um, <clears throat> and so you know in my department I there's about fifteen people I got along well with them all for years and years we then got this sort of poisonous social justice warrior who came in as the youngest member of the department. Um, I was head of department. This was sort of the youngest staff member. Then what happened was there was this debate uh, is called, you know, it was entitled, is rising diversity a threat to the West? Question mark. You know, it's not as though this, and in fact, this uh, debate involved, you know, a a black left wing social commentator, Trevor Phillips, you know, and a, a, a number of other left wingers, uh, David Aronovich, sort of very open borders, liberal, really interesting. And anyhow, so these activists went after this title and eventually forced the organizers to change it. Uh, but the fact I was participating in this was seen as, you know, beyond the pale by this social justice warrior. She was kind of emailing me uh, saying I shouldn't attend. I told her that I was going to attend and why. Um, and that was kind of the beginning, I suppose, of the troubles. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I got, you know, I was a critic of the social justice movement. I managed to get the Radical Student Union uh, to do a Twitter mobbing of me. The first of, you know, that would happen once or twice a year. Then a, there was an open letter. 
then there was an in, several internal investigations about tweets that I'd done and, you know, claiming these were offensive and, uh, you know, and they were, they would be things like retweeting Justin Trudeau, not being able to pronounce LGBTQ uh, and, and having a laugh at that, you know, that's the kind of level. So any sort of criticism of uh, these sort of social justice movements purporting to be in the name of race, racial, gender, or sexual minorities somehow therefore gets reinterpreted as you are hostile to these racial, gender, or sexual minorities, and therefore violating X and X policy about, you know, so this is the kind of game these people play. And so I've had about four, four of these internal investigations. Um, and, you know, some of the energy was coming out of the movement a little bit towards 2022. But, you know, I was also thinking I've been doing this particular job for 20 years. Um, wouldn't it be nice to be able to start something fresh and new and break some new ground in academia? And that's sort of when I decided to go to the University of Buckingham, which is really the only university with a free speech potential in the UK. And I say potential because it's very far from being a sort of it's certainly not a Hillsdale. I mean, it is essentially a regular university, but it has more oases of heterodox thought than other universities do. And it's got a leadership that's very committed to free speech over social justice. So those things make it very distinctive. And so that was what I thought, hey, you know, now there have been some push factors. Here are some pull factors. Let's go and try something new. It, there's a couple of things, Eric. Firstly, um, I find with you know, with some of my friends on the left, they sometimes say, oh, you know, this thing of people being cancelled, it doesn't really happen or whatever, you know, it's a bit of a hype roll or whatever. But I think I I, I heard Greg Lukianoff say that there's been six or 700 uh, academics up to this point who have actually lost their jobs through the... Uh, yeah, in fact, he, in his latest book, The Cancelling of the American Mind with Ricky Schlott, uh, yeah. shows that there's been more punishment of academics for speech than happened under McCarthyism. Yeah. And it's not, it's certainly not over, in fact. <laughs> so um, historians, they argue historians will look back on this as equivalent to the kind of Red Scare. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were living through it, so we don't realize how crazy it is. Um and yeah, these left-wing leftists, you know, they got their head in, in the sand. It's just standard my side bias. I mean, they just don't want to know and they conveniently brush away inconvenient facts. So, you know, you can say, it's like if I said in McCarthy, you say, oh, well, a few, few hundred people lost their jobs or a few thousand people. Uh, okay, it's just a few thousand people. Look, most people live their lives quite normally. And that's the kind of argument that the left will trot out it's like oh well there's only a few and who've been canceled and most people uh it's it's fine they don't notice it um <laughs> of course what they do notice is in fact the the chilling effect and so we have you know if you t if you look at surveys of conservative academics it's anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of those on the right saying that they self-censor in research teaching and discussions um so that is an enormous share who are self-censoring and that's kind of totally ignored by the left <laughs> so um so yeah i mean there's no question that there was a loss of freedom uh and mm. it's as a result of this radical uh, what i call woke which is making sacred of these historically marginalized identity groups to the point that any questioning of the social justice agenda or anything that might be twisted and construed to possibly be uh, in any way offensive to these groups uh, represents grounds for discipline. And there's one other thing I want to ask you about that, Eric, is, you know, the way I came to some of this is I remember going to see the statue of Giordano Bruno in Rome. And, uh, you know, he, of course, had his tongue taken out and was burned at the stake for heretical thinking. But I found it to be an incredibly overwhelming experience and and for someone that's probably tried to keep away from politics a little bit that there would be a political value the way that the you know that's a, that's clearly a strong political value for me is free speech independent free thinking other thinking you know so I, can you explain heterodox i mean I, I can remember seeing somewhere that 
ortho, orthodox, right thinking, heterodox, other thinking. And it seems that orthodox thinkers have often, uh, what's the word, throughout history, had a little bit mm. of a problem with heterodox thinking. So can you go into heterodox? What does it mean? How do you think about it? Well, I, I mean, I think it means going against the uh, the established um, dogmas of the time, especially, I guess, where those are invested with some kind of sacred significance. I mean, you can obviously be heterodox in a more mild way in that if everybody is a postmodernist and you're a critical realist or something, then you are heterodox, but you're not necessarily violating a concept of the sacred, which has become established. I mean, in my new book, Taboo, I talk about taboos around uh, racism, sexism, and then later homophobia and transphobia. But these are these are red lines that have been invested with a lot of emotional energy. And so they are sacred. If you, uh, you know, if you are seen as criticizing uh, or not respecting such groups or their spokespeople in any way, shape or form, then you are committing blasphemy. Um, and so I guess I, this idea of uh, violating sacred taboos is, is really what's behind the emotional energy of the cancel movement. I mean, if it was just the fact that you were a rational choice theorist and they were postmodernists, I mean, they, they may not like you, they may not hire you. I don't think it, it is invested with the same outrage and the same, um, you know, people completely losing it, uh, as we see with with cancel culture, because that, that comes from this perception that we have particular sacred categories, you know, black, indigenous, whatever, uh, trans, perhaps even, um, and that, you know, offending such people represents something disgusting. You know, I should have a disgust reflex physically, uh, because something sacred has been violated here. And so what I'm interested in is how uh, how it is that these particular groups and categories became sacred and not other groups and categories. I think that's a very much a partly accidental, partly deliberate project, but that once that's in place, it is what I call, I mean, it resets our entire moral universe. So I talk about the anti-racism taboo as the big bang of our moral universe it's expanding outwards. The reverberations of that Big Bang, we're living through that. Um, and I don't think we can understand where we are without going back to that mid-1960s, originally American uh, anti-racism taboo, which came to be invested with a lot of emotional energy and seen as a deep source of meaning uh, by left liberals. And out of that springs so many things. And I think we would have got here anyway. Now, yes, social media sped up the process, accelerated everything. There's no question that some of these things have been forced multipliers, but I still believe we would have got here eventually anyway because of the outworking of the logic of what it means to say particular groups are sacred and cannot be offended. And once that's in place, it justifies all kinds of things. It's like kryptonite. Of course, it then offers an incentive for uh, left-wing activists to weaponize this and to ca start calling other things racist with aren't, which aren't racist because then you can um, make use of this kryptonite, of this power that comes from the magic, the sacred. And so this is all, it's about, it's a bit like putty stretching this valuable substance of sacredness to from race to sex to, to, to gay to trans, from, from calling somebody the N-word to their face to... Um, mispronouncing their name to to saying that anyone can make it in in America you know so all of those things become racist uh, by these moral entre these outrage entrepreneurs are able to stretch this putty outwards and outwards and outwards so that more and more of life is permeated by these taboos but again some of my my lefty friends if I can put it that way would say well you know, woke came from that time you know martin luther king and you know do you disagree with that uh do you think that there's right. a, but my own feeling is that this is what i would feel is that there's a lot of people that maybe uh were invested in that or agreed with that at the time of martin luther king and are behind that and 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 don't believe in racism and sexism and all of that 
but it's become more extreme over time. The word woke has, has changed from that kind of good faith beginning, if I could put it in that language, to something which has become a little more uh, like a religion which is a, a, a very much a punishing religion if you step out of the bounds. Yeah, I think I think this whole woke thing, I mean, obviously words can change their meaning. Um, I just noticed, <laughs> I was looking up uh, movies on ice hockey. There's one from the 1940s called Gay Blades. <laughs> and so the word gay has obviously changed its meaning considerably and the word woke no doubt has changed its meaning considerably as well I, you can't just sort of look at the same word in the past and mm -hmm. assume it had the same meaning i think what we we are living through though is you know if you look at the um left liberal philosophy underlying woke it's got a number of components i mean two of which are uh egalitarianism and and, and humanitarianism and i think those things up to a point uh make life better for people and, and for society but it's like anything else once you overreach and you overshoot the optimum you're then into diminishing returns and immiserization and i think that's really where we've gone so for really very quickly in the 60s after martin luther king makes his speech you know you see the meaning of um equal rights and equal treatment go from this idea of everybody should be treated equally without regard to the color of their skin to you must treat people unequally due to the color of their skin to achieve quote unquote goals and timetables for equal outcomes. And that's a matter of only a few years between 1965 and the late 60s. And, and Martin Luther King, by the way, also, he's advocating by 1967 for reparations and for the, you know, essentially the uh, Johnson affirmative action agenda. Um, so, so this very quickly slips its leash. Um, and I think this is what people don't understand is you can have a, a set of principles which are good up to a point and then become negative beyond a certain point. And so, so much of what I think we are experiencing is uh, simply the overshoot of these principles. Uh, humanitarianism is another one. You, you want to uh, treat the weak and vulnerable well, but once you elevate that into a religion and you start to say, well, we don't want to offend them and anything which offends even the most sensitive member of a historically marginalized group cannot be allowed, you then strangle your culture, your creativity, you, you limit excellence and beauty in your society, uh, cohesion, freedom, all of these things are impaired. Uh, and that's, again, what we're living with is, is the over overriding emphasis on the what Jonathan Haidt would call the care, harm, and equality moral foundations. Those are the only things that matter when it comes to cultural groups, and therefore they should be just maximized and pushed to the <coughs> limit absolute goods. The reality is they're not absolute goods. They need to be balanced and traded off with other uh, important values, and that's not happening, and so we're seeing an immiserization. And you've also said some interesting things about empathy, like... Uh... You know, empathy depends on on what you're empathetic towards, uh, because of course it'll be said, well, that uh, any view against wokeism, wokeism is non-empathetic. But uh, if you are empathetic towards uh, independent free thinking, uh, you might have a slightly different view on that. It seems to me. Yeah, I, and 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 this is this is the problem: is that the social justice types. They think empathy has an automatic meaning that, you know, oh, yes, empathy for, but they don't actually understand that, you know, empathy for one often means withdrawal of empathy for another. So if you're empathetic towards the criminal, you're not going to be empathetic towards the victim. If you're empathetic towards a young person who wants to transition, you might not be empathetic towards that same individual who wants to detransition and says, why didn't anybody actually, you know, talk to me before they before I transition why were they encouraging me to transition you see what I mean so the empathy is very selective and the sort of woke left don't understand that these things involve trade-offs they don't understand the idea of trade-offs they somehow airbrush the sort of negative the victim out of their um, belief system so when they say trans rights they airbrush the idea you know that essentially this idea of biological male being allowed to enter a woman's space, they airbrush out 
the women who don't want that biological male in their space. That person doesn't count. It's, so it's actually a clash of rights. It's not trans rights. It's trans rights versus women's rights. And they, but they tell themselves, no, this is just trans rights. And we're going to rub out that women's rights part. And they do the same thing for race as well. You know, if you, it's all about, you know, minority rights, but they rub out majority rights, the rights, for example, to express their identity. Well, if, if, if white people expressing their identity is seen as, as scary or offensive to some minorities, we have to prevent white people expressing their identity or, or expressing national identity um, or, a, or an attachment to heroes in the past. Um, so what that does is it's actually a clash of rights and they're simply ignoring the fact that the majority group has rights too. And so they're only talking about the rights for certain groups and not others. So it's it's very disingenuous, but it's a nice little sleight of hand that seems seems rhetorically to fool a lot of people, uh, but it's a dishonest conversation. So Eric, can you tell us a little bit about some of your research? And, and you know, I know you've done a lot of research on this and what, what are some of the main threads or, or, or some of, what are some of the most important pieces of research you've done for you? Yeah, so the main method I use is survey research, um, mm -hmm. my own and others. Uh, so it's not that I'm dismissing the importance of stories and anecdotes, but I think you it's it's useful to to be able to generalize to larger populations through using large surveys. And so I've done a number of surveys in the I mean lots in the book. So I, for example, if you just take public opinion, and I've mainly focused on US, UK, and to some extent, Canada, uh, with a bit of Australia here and there, but I mean, basically... basically <laughs> nice of you, you to uh, throw that in. There yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's pretty similar. There's no real major differences. Yeah. But, but basically, you've got two people who are anti-woke for everyone that is woke mm -hmm. across a range of 50 questions. Now, there's big variations there. Mm -hmm. But if you say, you know, is... Do you think Britain is a racist country? Most British people will say no. You know, should kids be taught that? Most will say no. But it'll be about 70 to 30 or two to one. Um, do you, you know, should kids be separated by race into oppressor and oppressed? It's always 90 plus percent no. Um, and yet that does happen in schools, right? Has happened. Um, but now that's the, at the extreme end. You know, should you teach that there are, uh, you know, uh, gender is a, is a choice and it's not biological you know that again very heavy opposition these are just some examples of questions that i'd ask or whether individuals should be cancelled should should jk rowling be dropped by her publisher uh very few people although what's disturbing is that amongst young people it's it's a much closer call um can, but overall you, in the can public you just go into that for a little while why is it more with younger people what's your idea behind that or, or, well, or... I just think I think that they have been <laughs> raised a different set of values than people, certainly people aged 40 plus. So people under 40, but particularly as we get into the under 25s, they're influenced both by social media and by radical teachers that who have essentially pushed cultural left values, the equity diversity values uh, much more strongly than the enlightenment values. Um and so they're hearing about how awful their history is. Um, you know, they're hearing it's always about diversity and respect and, and, and celebrating this or that month or day, whether it be Pride or Black history or whatever. Um, so what they are being taught is these are the sacred values around historically marginalized groups. You must defer. You must bow down. Um, and... Values such as free speech uh, and objective truth and equal treatment are secondary if if they even feature at all. Uh, so, for example, um, so I just think that's the basis. I mean, there have been some studies that show also that younger people are much more morally absolutist than their predecessors. Uh, and this is if we're comparing 18 year olds in 2000, there have been studies, one of which repeated a survey at Smith College that was done in 2000 saying that, you know, people should be allowed to, you know, even if views of offend, people should be allowed to say them, where you, whereas you had three quarters agreement with that amongst the students in 2000, that's down to, you know, 50% in 2016. Um, you know, is there absolute right or wrong? Young people are much more likely to say there is now than in the past, where there was more of a morally relativist view. 
And, and so, yeah, we've had this shift towards moral absolutism and the more education, the more morally absolutist now, which, which completely turned an entire literature on its head, which always used to argue more education makes people more kind of relativist and think that, that, you know, values are a bit more, you know, people have competing values and it's a more pluralistic world. Now, the more education you have, the more you're into this very binary good and bad worldview, which I think just shows the power and the effectiveness of social justice indoctrination in the school system and up through into universities, although really the game is over. By the time they set foot on campus, it, I don't think universities make much difference. So yeah, just their their social media and their, the school system, which has been captured by the woke left effectively over the last while, is just socializing the generation differently. Um, having said that, of course, the internet is a big place and there is a significant number of young people who are finding different views online. And so what we're actually seeing is a real polarization there is a the mainstream among young people is woke but you have the very strong or significant uh dissenting group which is more male um and so we're seeing a, a widening gender gap uh, among young people in their politics young people uh, young men are significantly are, are more similar to older generations and in some ways more likely to vote for populists for example um but you've got this, these, you know, young women are, are much further to the left than, than older women are. So what are the figures, say J.K. Rowling, for example, what do, what are the percentage of older people that think she should be able to say what she wants, if I could put it that way? And what are the percentage of young people? Well, for young people, amongst those who say they have an opinion, which might be about two thirds, it splits pretty much 50-50. She should be dropped. She shouldn't be dropped. Whereas anyone over 45, the number who say she shouldn't be dropped is somewhere between 2 and 6%. So it's basically almost nobody. Um, and that's kind of just one example of how big an age gradation there is that young, you know, young people, particularly young people on the left, are just far less tolerant than compared to older people on the left. Old leftists are really a lot more tolerant. And we see this in many other ways. You know, if you look, I did a, a series of surveys on faculty in Canada, the US and Britain, and also looked at PhD students as well, graduate students. And what you see, I had sort of five scenarios of, of whether people should lose their job for doing research that is controversial. So saying, for example, that, you know, traditional two parent families have better outcomes or the British empire did more good than harm or, more diverse organizations perform more poorly. These were all hypotheticals. Um, and what you saw was that, uh, you know, older academics, if you take the five scenarios I outlined, it was between 10 and 15% who would say that there should be cancellation in at least one of these five scenarios. For academics 35 and under, it was over twice as high. So, and, and, that's, and that has been replicated in a, you know, a FIRE survey that I was involved, Foundation for Individual Rights and, and Expression survey of American faculty. So young faculty are a lot more intolerant, uh, just as young people in general are a lot more intolerant of anything that violates um, one of the sacred uh, progressive totems, race, gender, sexuality, or, or is perceived in some way to be offensive to one of those totemic groups. Um, and yeah, so this is really the kind of structure of sacredness and myth that they have kind of been imbibed with. Um, and so, yeah, that's where we are, unfortunately. And, and the data is pretty clear. Uh, so there's even some other, I mean, to give you some more striking numbers from the foundation, from the fire faculty surveys, which not faculty, but the student surveys conducted every year, 55,000. So an absolutely monster sample of uh, students largely at the top 200, uh, you know, top 20% of universities in America, but not only the top 20%, but mainly. And what you see are, for example, between 70% and 85% of those polled do not think a speaker who says trans is a mental disorder should be permitted to speak on campus. Um, similarly, person who says Black Lives Matter is a hate group, similar share, do not think they should be allowed to speak on campus. So we have an incredibly intolerant uh, young population. And um, what, what we do about that going forward, so all they've learned about is the social justice values. They have not learned the free speech values. 
Uh, they haven't been taught it because their teachers only want them to know the social justice stuff. Um, so where are we, and, and also online, they've been tracked into TikTok and, and Tumblr and these various places that, that push the victimhood narrative. So um, how we get out of that and restore that more classically liberal enlightenment outlook uh, I think it's going to take a, a, a root and branch reform of the public education system, actually. Uh, it's not it's not going to completely change things, but we actually we have to sort of try and reform where we can. Uh, we can't really deal with we can't deal with TikTok <laughs> other than through the battle of ideas. But mm -hmm. I think we can insist upon uh, neutrality and depoliticization of the school system. So, you know, just in my area in psychology, too, it's uh, when you think of um the need for neutrality in, in, in psychology because uh, it's very important and, and also the ability, uh, you know, how it all began with Freud and, and the others was through the, what is it, the free association of fantasy and the ability to, to it, it's a total free speech therapy in, in its very origins. So the idea of uh, uh, being a therapist with an ideological model is a little bit problem problematic in terms of uh, uh, allowing people to air their fantasies in a neutral space, if I could put it that way. Well, yeah, no, but I mean, there's now, um, there's an interesting book, I think it's called, uh, yeah, I'm just looking at it now, Ideological and Political Bias in Psychology. You might have seen that. No, I haven't, that no. Text. Um, but... Yeah, these whole psychotherapy field is completely permeated by social justice ideology to the point where, you know, men and conservatives find it very difficult to, um, you know, very often they will have, if these topics get raised, uh, you know, their their therapist will, will insist that they have some psychosis um, if, they, if they have the wrong views and the wrong beliefs. Um, so yeah, and, and, and of course their whole attitude to masculinity and to, uh, you know, general, to, to, I mean, essentially we have an enormous problem, uh, in psychotherapy more generally. And in fact, this is impairing, you know, if you just look at the mental health crisis among young people, um, an unwillingness to really ask tough questions about how the emphasis on fragility and victimhood particularly for, uh, you know, encouraging people to identify with disadvantaged and disadvantaged groups and to think that external forces are impacting upon them when really my understanding is CBT and other, uh, the strength-based approach and these other approaches, which actually have a good track record, are being downplayed because they're seen as politically incorrect, even, even though they get results, whereas these sort of, you know, and, and also the medicalization of ordinary swings of mood. Uh, all of this, I think, is contributing to this mental health crisis with Jonathan Haidt. Haidt talks about and Twenge talks about. Um, and so, yeah. And also, what are the connections? You know, we know that, for example, being very left, um, being LGBT, are very highly, strongly connected in young people to having you know, mental health issues. Now, what is going on there? It could be a number of stories. The only acceptable story there is to say, well, um, you know, LGBT people experience prejudice, and so that's why they have mental health issues. Now, that could be the explanation, or it could be a part of the explanation, but it's it's interesting that those mental health problems have soared as toleration has increased. Yeah. So that would suggest there might be another explanation for this. Again, the psychology field, because it is so captured, cannot answer these questions. I think, you know, the psychology field has been captive, uh, captured by the idea of the victim uh, uh, extensively. And that's why I like your idea of resilience so much. That, uh, that to me, you know, in this, what is it, this, in the culture wars, we're being exposed to a lot of darkness, a lot of propaganda, a lot of, you know, it's heavy. It's a heavy thing going on and that this idea of leaning in and the idea of resilience has become such a an important idea you know it, it's a huge idea because the victim is uh, uh it's been overall in my opinion mm. yeah yeah well, the, well, we have we live in what you know uh, Campbell and Manning in their book, The Rise of Victimhood Culture, which mm -hmm. which I would recommend. I mean, talking about how 
culture has evolved towards valorizing victims. Um, now, certain kinds of victims. I mean, essentially, yeah. if you're a victim of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, those are sort of first among equals on the victimhood poll. But equally, then that creates a certain openness to other kinds of victimhood narratives as well, neurodivergence, for example. Uh, and so emphasizing that is very important, um, you know, to the to our zeitgeist. And I think it has psychological downstream effects as well. Um, and, and yeah, so resilience, I mean, I think is has got to be a core concept of getting us out of the cul-de-sac we're in. And, and certainly the, um, you know, the mental health crisis uh, is, is, is just probably the most obvious manifestation of that. But, but of course there are others. I mean, the free speech crisis is an outgrowth of yeah. this same idea that you're always going to emphasize the feelings of those who feel hurt and offended over the freedom of somebody to speak. And, and, and as you said earlier, these are, these are trade-offs, you know, these uh, are necessary trade-offs. But, but Eric, what's your, what's your opinion, uh, thoughts, ideas about resilience? How do you, how do you see it? Well, resilience? Well, I think it needs to, it's a whole ethos that needs to be involved a whole of society approach rather than a band-aid. And I think it would upend the entire left liberal project, which has become extreme really in the last, at various points in the last 60 years. So it is going to involve a, a fundamental re-examination of the cherished prejudices of our dominant left liberal order. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing for people who've invested their whole selves into being part of this left liberal avant-garde, which we know as woke. I mean, they think that they are on the right side of history. They're on, on God's path in a way. And so to actually question the, the value of victimhood and to say to people, well, you know, actually, you know, we have to be able to offend, you know, this idea of inclusion that somehow if people feel offended, they won't feel included. You know, they actually have to become more resilient to slights, and we have to we have to use resilience rather than speech codes uh, to actually achieve uh, the same effect. And actually, that will help the very groups you claim to um, to want to help. Although the reality is that a lot of the social justice left isn't particularly interested in um, their chosen victim groups doing better. In my view, the, I mean, as Shelby Steele in his book White Guilt argues. Many of these DEI policies are really about virtue signaling, that, that I have moral authority, I'm not one of the bad whites, um, and therefore affirmative action. So, so I don't, I'm kind of, you know, my view is that these policies are mainly about ministering to the quest for meaning amongst that sort of more elite social justice left and, than and, it is really about measurable outcomes. Yeah. And elevating status, perhaps. You know, being one of the um, good guys is a, is a way one can elevate one's status in the in, in the world. Yeah, this is an interesting debate, right? So you've had a number of books, and uh, mm. Rob Henderson and Bacha yeah. uh, Garsargon and and a number of others who've who've talked about the importance of the status element. I mean, I think I guess I would see it more as a kind of moral. They see themselves as a moral avant garde, so moral virtuosity. Um, they, they are a kind of culture, yeah, I guess a kind of cultural elite. Now, we can have a debate over whether there is an argument, which I'm persuaded by, that you know, if you take the academy, grievance studies is not does not have a lot of prestige within the academy and the top journals in most social science fields are quantitative. So it's true that, you know, I'm not sure how high the status of these beliefs of DEI really is, but I think... There is this sense that okay, we may not be respected uh, intellectually, but we are, you know, we have the the purest moral virtues. Uh, so I think it more, I, I see it more as a kind of moral virtuosity than a status thing. I mean, yeah. now of course there are certain beliefs which are seen as low status, you know, uh, uh, clearly being narrow, narrowly prejudiced or whatever. But I just think I'm just not. Sure, I'm 100% on board oh, the sure. argument that, that the woke beliefs have high status. Just to give you a little bit of an anecdotal story, yeah. Eric, though, is that I saw something on Facebook which made me laugh. It said, 
They call us woke because they can't spell enlightened. And <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons it made me laugh was that I, I, I had a little epiphany that it's true that many woke people feel that they're enlightened and that, you know, obviously being interested in Carl Jung, he, you know, he would say something like, it's very important to see through the craziness of something like thinking you're enlightened, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a spiritual craziness towards that and wholeness is to embrace your shadow and your limitation and to be, you know, to have a foot on the ground or whatever. But I, I find that, you know, when you talk about the elite, you're also talking about people that think they have the answers. And therefore, anyone on the conservative position, they basically think they don't listen because they basically think they're not enlightened and they're dumb ups. So what happens is uh, there you have that incredible ego of that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're, you're right, although I, I think, yeah, there's all, there's partly that they think they're not as smart, they think that they've got the answer, uh, but I also think there's a second element, which is that, whereas a conservative might say, well, leftists, you know, they're wrong, I think the leftist is more likely to say the conservative person is evil or bad, right, so there's more of a kind of moralistic judgment uh, at least on the social justice left, the cultural left. And this is sort of the element which I think is important. Is, you know, if you look, I, I think a lot of the anti-conservative uh, sentiment which comes out of the woke left is, is animated by this view that, you know, those conservatives are, are nasty, racist, sexist, bigots. Um, so it's injected with all of the taboos. Whereas I think the right may think, you know, the left are a bunch of naive, you know, what, you know, they're naive and, all, and then they have all the wrong answers and they're not realistic about the world. But they're not necessarily going after the moral character the way the left does it to the right. And, and I think that's quite important. I mean, I've done some. So, for example, if you look at there's a question I ask on one of my surveys uh, that says, do you agree with the following statement? White Republicans are racist. And, and you get amongst um, those who are Democrats or, or liberals, you know, something like two thirds of white liberals will say, yes, yes, they're racist. Um, and this sort of permeates so many of the attitudes uh, that we see. So, for, so if you if you think that white Repub all white Repub Republicans are racist, you are much more likely to also say uh, people who disagree with me politically are immoral. So there's a kind of link between you know, essentially if you moralize politics, uh, it's no longer a question of people disagreeing, uh, having different values, having seeing things that in a different way it's like these people are morally offensive and, and degraded um so i think it is that more than a sense of intellectual superiority i mean that's there of course as well but i think it's much more this this kind of moral absolutism and moralization of politics into a binary black and white good and evil i mean that is really what's characteristic of our current system so we're getting on to how how to tackle which is, you know, uh, the last part of your book. Can you explain some of those ideas? And just remembering, if we could maybe go back to, you know, what I read at the beginning, a post-woke vision, foregrounds resilience, uh, you know, a focus on all aspects of human flourishing. Can you, get, can you expand upon that a little more? And what are you talking about? Well, there's really, yeah, I guess you could almost say there's kind of two components to the solutions in the book. You know, one is the more immediate, short-term and practical. Yeah. And the second is the longer-term battle of ideas and the vision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll just start with the first, which is really about the short-term, is I think we need to make the institutions of society reflect the values of the demos. So we need democracy to penetrate into the institutions. And it's simply not right that two thirds of the public is against the woke agenda. And yet the woke agenda is more or less the writ of that agenda runs through all our institutions. So the first set of proposals really is about mobilizing elected government to go in and reform if need be, break, you know, abolish sections of the bureaucracy, 
institute political neutrality, enforce that neutrality in schools, in the civil service, public bodies. Um, that is kind of job one, is to get rid of the indoctrination in schools and the politicization of uh, government bodies. And that means redefining things that the activists like to claim are just moral and consensual. Uh, you know, so for example, the whole DEI apparatus largely needs to be abolished um, or redefined. Um, so it, it, it's simply not, you cannot use the term structural racism without being political. So this means that governments are going to have to get very granular in the guidance that they issue to public bodies. So it's not, you know, you have to have the law, but it's not enough. So for example, in Britain, there's a law against political indoctrination in the classroom. The problem is that the guidance that is accompanying that law is too baggy and it has too many loopholes. So activist teachers can simply drive a train through those loopholes. If you had a 15 pages of detailed guidance saying, for example, um, we define racism as interpersonal slurs or uh, you know expressing superiority or hatred towards a group and you structural racism is a pseudoscientific non-evidence-based concept that's political you can't teach it in class so that's what i mean is sort of getting into the weeds or defining the history curriculum in such a way that you cannot talk about american slavery without talking about one other non-european form of slavery it might be comanche uh, it might be Ottoman, it might be something else. So so that people understand that this is not a an exceptional Western thing. This is sort of what happened. Or stealing land, every country is built on stolen land, not just the United States and Australia. And, and, and you know, so, so this is part of what is necessary in order to start tweaking the emotional landscape, the kind of emotional regime. It's not that the facts, you know, kids should learn about slavery. The problem is the emotional charge they are attaching to that uh, and the way that's staining their view of their country. That is what's wrong. It's all on the emotional knobs that are up too high in certain categories and down too low in others. Um, so yeah, that that's just kind of the level of detail. Now, in terms of the vision, so we need to re radically reform the public sector, uh, but we also need to um, propound, I think, in the long term, in the battle of ideas, a new vision in which we sort of gradually turn the volume knob down on these taboos so that they become norms. We should have a norm against anti against racism like we have a norm against elitism or a norm against other things we don't like. But I think this whole binary totalizing uh, social death, immediate social death, no, no, we don't make any distinctions between more serious and less serious racism, first offense, second offense. So we have to deal with the taboos and we have to turn the volume down on them. But in addition, um, we need to propound a vision, which is, as you say, it's kind of instead of cultural, what I call cultural socialism, which is basically says equal outcomes for men and women, for black and white to be enforced through quotas. Um, and we need to have uh, emotional safety, emotional harm protection for minority groups. So we can't have free speech. We can't have objective truth. We can't teach the national past. Um, all of that needs to be changed so that we move away from that cultural socialist model to what I, what I would call a cultural wealth model or human flourishing model, which doesn't just look at the value of equality and harm protection, but also looks at a whole range of other values which are being downgraded, merit, beauty, excellence, cohesion, freedom, uh, reason, all of these other things actually have to be upgraded. Uh, in order that the pie, the holistic conception of the good life and of the societal, of the common good is maximized. So we want to maximize the common good, not just cultural socialism. Um, and, and it's very similar to the problem during the Cold War, where you had the economic socialist model, which wants to have a, everybody have exactly the same. We're going to divide the pie up equally. That leads to a shrinking of the pie. Um, whereas if you allow some inequality, people to accumulate capital, uh, and have more of an incentive to work and create businesses, that grows the pie for everybody. And so there is the trade-off, which economists talk about, the equity efficiency, call it you know, equality and wealth, there's a trade-off. We have to have some equality and redistribution, but we also have to allow the econ economy to grow. And it's the same with culture. We need to have some attention to representation by race and gender and other characteristics, but we also have to accept a certain amount of inequality is necessary for the culture to grow and for humans to flourish. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the vision that I would say we need to be moving toward. 
It's one other thing that strikes me is that, it, you know, your book begs the question. To me, uh, race, gender are not sacred within, within their own right. It, it does beg the question of what is sacred. So maybe, can we finish with that, Eric? What, what's your idea of what is sacred? What actually is today in our society sacred? Well, no, for I you, mean, in terms of your vision. Oh, um, well, I I tend to shy away from that wanting to make things super sacred because then they can't ever be questioned without uh, a very authoritarian reaction. However, I think it's okay to to value things, you know. So if you take, for example, the value of the nation, you know, which I think has been downgraded. You know, this would be something I think would be important. The value of free speech would be important. Excellence, beauty uh, as well, beauty and, and, and social cohesion, for example. These are all important values which have suffered under our current cultural socialist uh, regime. So I guess those are things that I would value. I wouldn't want to make them sacred to the point that no one's allowed to question them. I, yeah. So, so that, I guess that's where I would... I would demur, but um, but yeah, I definitely think right now we've replaced the older sacred values around, you know, faith, flag, and family has been replaced with the new sacred values around historically marginalized groups. Um, and so I think we've got to be rebalancing things back the other way, but without going into a position where you have a new set of sacred values with a new set of taboos and a new set of orthodoxies, I, I just think... I'm not of the view, you know, some post-liberals, uh, you know, Yoram Hazoni and some people uh, would argue we need to, you know, they've got their sacred values in. We need to get those ones out and put ours in. I think I'm still of the view we can have a, you know, we can have an ideal of a sort of depoliticized, politically neutral and balanced um, set of public institutions where ideas can compete and, you know, they can compete in civil society and the good ones maybe more persuasive at certain times. That's the model that I would like to go for. Uh, what we instead have is the cultural left has infiltrated uh, and undermined our public institutions, which is undermining trust in those institutions. I don't know if you've, if you've seen the latest numbers um, in terms of trust in American universities from Republicans and even independents. So amongst, amongst Republicans, the share who who don't have trust in in higher education has absolutely soared to over fifty percent now. With only I think about fifteen percent or thereabouts expressing high trust in universities. Uh, so in a, a sea change, and even amongst independents, there's been a, a a big I think twenty thirty point increase in the share who who lack confidence in universities. And the main reason that given is because of they are seen as essentially indoctrinating into left-wing ideas. So that's just an example of where this attempt to subvert and infiltrate institutions, which has been very successful, and, and the woke left is able to do that because they're able to, to harness the power of these taboos. So if you oppose any sort of DEI measure, you are a racist or a sexist, they're able to wield these taboos very effectively and to, to give them force multiplication in these institutions and take them over, or at least to remake their ethos. What that does is it simply tanks the trust uh, in those particular institutions. And just finally, Eric, yes. um, the future, you're, you're not of the opinion, you know, sometimes people might think, well, this has been a zeitgeist, you know, that, that this, hmm. this present incarnation of the woke uprising that will, like some wind will blow over uh, quickly, like the 60s kind of blew over, you know, after, you know, maybe it was 12 years, 60 to 72 or whatever. But you're not quite of that view, are you? you you're... No. Yeah, this view that woke has peaked and it's a fad and it's going to fade away, I think that's wrong. I mean, mm. if you look back to the 60s, for example, what happened in the 60s, sure, you know, the rioting may have stopped or ebbed away, but there were lasting value changes. Some of, by the way, some of which I agree with, but there were lasting value changes that reverberated throughout society for decades to come. Mm. Um, views on, you know, divorce and sex before marriage and, and uh, you know, many things shifted in the 60s. Uh, in addition, it's it's worth saying that, you know, the first cancellations occurred in around race in the mid-60s. The Moynihan Report of 1965 
on the black family being shelved was the first instance of this kind of race-based cancellation. But there were others in the 70s, um, which I could go into, uh, James Coleman and the American Sociological Association talking about busing. So yeah, that was starting to happen. And these were kind of early premonitions of what was going to happen at, at scale later. So what I would say is actually the awakening of the post-2015 Great Awakening actually is the third, not the first, awakening. And so if you go back to the 90s, we had political correctness. Political correctness and speech codes and, and, and affirmative action didn't just go away, uh, even the, though they there was a certain degree of energy, perhaps around the Rodney King riots, uh, but from the late 80s up until the Rodney King riots, um, but it didn't just fade away. I mean, those speech codes remained on the books of universities. They continued to be enforced. They got routinized and, and um, institutionalized. And so there was a sort of peak, a sort of falling down, a flattening out. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing, yes, DEIs being cut back. And, and we are seeing some movement, even at the Harvards and MITs, away from extreme manifestations of social justice ideology. But it's only a slight retreat. Much of this remains in place. Um, so, for example, universities are going to strenuously try and maintain uh, uh, and mirror the racial composition of the population in their admittance procedures, despite the Supreme Court rulings. So those policies firmly remain in place. Uh, they will shape shift, but the, the drive behind the ideological belief and the institutionalization of these in the administrative apparatus of these organizations remains. And therefore, it is not going away. We've trimmed back the bush. The next, you know, there will be another awakening because the, we haven't actually reformed the fundamental values of society and the fundamental taboos of society. They remain what they were post the 60s, which is race, gender, now sexuality. Uh, have, these are the taboos that govern our moral order. Uh, the, the core values are the equality and care harm for identity group values as they have been since the mid 60s. Yeah. Now, the, the scale has been increased. There has been a, a, a bit of a sort of pushback, but I think it's temporary. And I think we are once the 20 somethings of today with their woke values or, or their more woke values, once they become the median voter and the median leader, I think that'll make a material difference in our culture, the same way that when the baby boomers, with their more relaxed attitude to divorce, their less, somewhat less religious orientation, when they became the median voter, that did change society in this left liberal direction. So I don't see any reason, well, there's a slight coda. So my background argument is that I don't see a major reason to think that the drift of the last 60 years, in terms of cultural attitudes to the left, uh, is going to be reversed. Now, the only thing I would say is just, I mean, who knows, but in the last 18 months or so, uh, there is some evidence that I've seen in the UK data on young people to show a certain move to the right on unisex versus um, single sex bathrooms and on the immigration issue. You know, to the extent, if that is durable, you know, if it is the case that this pushback on DEI is reverberating in terms of the attitudes of young people and shifting things amongst young people, that could be a change that's worth looking at. And, 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 and it is also worth saying that the, the losses that the, uh, the, the, the trans rights kind of, we'll call it the trans rights lobby has suffered in a number of Western countries over the past couple of years. Um, and the shift in public attitudes against the trans rights position over the last two, three years. Um, there haven't been many such shifts in public attitudes in the last 60 years. And, and is it the case, I mean, the one question mark is, is it the case that the issue of trans could be the issue that breaks the 60 year momentum of left liberalism? And That's think, a question. And I think yeah. what's definitely happening is that whilst I mean, my language, whilst wokes are doing woke, uh, there's strange alliances. You know, you can say people going more towards the right or maybe trying to head towards the centre as well. And there's strange alliances developing between libertarians and people and, and conservatives and perhaps a growing number of older people that, well, this is just what I may be experiencing in terms of the feedback from social media. 
but joining together in in their own little heterodox community, if I could put it that way. Yeah, I, I think this is interesting to watch what happens to the kind of center left or classical or more liberal, classical liberal minded, older left, as you say, will there will they change their vote is a very difficult question. I mean, I, I think you can the Canadian Conservative Party is riding very high in the polls right now. And clearly there are people who were liberal voters who voted for this more left liberal party that have moved over to the conservatives. And I, I'm t we don't yet know who those people are, but it could be that some of the people you're talking about may have had enough of Trudeau style woke uh, leftism and decided this, this is just too much. And it's, it's taking the country in a negative divisive direction. Um, so I think that's possible. It's less possible in the American context where it's much more, polarized and these party identities are much There's more just two oh, tribes and that's it basically you know uh, to a lot certainly amongst white americans they're very polarized yeah. um you know so so i think that's a different situation but in many of the other countries there's more fluidity and more ability for people to move um, and it's going to be interesting certainly the public is not on board the trans agenda uh and 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 that's now you know you look in britain at the election here and Keir Starmer who's the current Labour Prime Minister and many of his key people have been very careful to essentially essentially go with the sort of you know gender critical line to say that you know a woman is is essentially an adult human female so they have been kind of whether they want to do this or they're being forced to by in order to win elections, they've actually tacked towards the center on the gender issue. And yeah. even if, even though that's annoyed a lot of their activists, mm -hmm. they understand that you can't win an election and say that anyone who wants to be can be a woman. Um, so, so perhaps that's evidence of something mm -hmm. pushing towards the center. Yeah. Thanks very much, Eric. And um, good luck with your book. And I personally found it very interesting to read and thought provoking and, Lots of lots of good stuff in there, basically. Well, John, thank you so much, uh, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks. All right.